about how to protect your company's value. So boards and C-suites need to really exercise more influence on the planning and, and processes in, anticipate, in anticipation of a cybersecurity event. And then that will allow for better and more efficient stakeholder engagement and the communications that we all think about as, as necessary in these, in these crisis and cyber events. And I think for the most part, publics, the general public, they might not understand the nuance of ransomware and data breaches, but they understand at this point that cyber threat actors and the black hats really are, are kind of control the game. And, and companies are victims. They can't keep pace with the sophistication of the bad guys, the threat actors um, to the extent they need to. And you saw that with, um, everybody talks about Equifax, um, but part of the problem with Equifax was not necessarily their messaging. It's, be, it's that they were paralyzed, completely paralyzed in fear. They had no preparation beforehand. Their communications were lagging, no processes in place, and it had a tremendous impact on their reputation and they still haven't recovered. So I think making sure everyone in leadership is on the same page and the company is prepared as much as possible ahead of time is the primary consideration. Just a, maybe a few things I'll add. Um, so, and definitely strongly, strongly echo everything Robert said, you know, planning is so important. It's so much easier to have um, discussions and talk through different scenarios when your house is not on fire. Um, when it's on fire is not the time to be trying to figure out what's the, uh, the, the fire escape route uh, because by then it's too late. Um, so just having a, a, a actual practical and actionable incident response plan. Um, I always find it funny when clients come to us and they're like, you know, they measure the effectiveness of their incident response plan by the number of pages that it contains. You know, so we, we had one client was like so proud they had a 70 page incident response plan. And we thumbed through it. We're like, all right, let's do it. Let's do a scenario. Let's see how well this works for you. <laughs> As you, imagine, you it my point. I mean, it just, we I already knew how the story was going to end. And so we were like five minutes into it. And they're like, all right, this is not going to work. <laughs> I was like, wow, you guys figure that out pretty quickly. Um, but also have an incident response playbooks. So, you know, looking at the risks that are most likely, um, you know, to, to impact the organization and saying, okay, what are we going to do in the instance of a ransomware event or in the instance of business email compromise or insider threat? And again, putting it in place a framework, but not something that is so restrictive that it paralyzes the organization um, responding. Uh, one thing um, that we're seeing more and more organizations do is, what are, what are characterized as MITRE attack simulations. So like one thing that organizations have not been able to get a comfort level with, there's lots of them, is the effectiveness of their tools to actually identify, um, you know, and help them respond. And so there is a way, it's sort of like a, the, um, you know, the, the, the complementary uh, set of activities to a tabletop exercise where you're actually testing your security tools. You're saying, okay, are they actually going to alert if, they, if we see certain things, and if they do, what actions are we gonna take? So attack simulations, really simple exercise. They make them sound really complicated, you know, literally just a few hours, but it gives you a comfort level that your tools and your staff or your outsourced vendor, if you're using an outsourced vendor, are actually going to be able to catch, uh, because Robert's right, it's, you know, the, the threat actors, the, the black hats, they have the advantage. They, you know, they're always one step ahead um, and so just trying to make sure another, another area is, you know, pen testing again, you know, simulating hiring white hat hackers to, you know, to, to play the, the role of a bad guy or a bad girl and, and attack the organization and, um, you know, and, and see what they're able, most, you know, instances they're going to get in. So it's, again, it's more a learning experience. It's not, you know, were they able to get in or not? Clearly that's part of it, but it's also, how did we respond? What did we see? Um, it's really just testing the, the system, the environment, the people, um, you know, what is it? A, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of uh, something. I actually don't know the end of that phrase, but uh, again, can't emphasize that enough. You, you do not want to be on a call 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning trying to figure this stuff out. It is not pretty. Yeah, and I'll, I'll piggyback on both uh, Bob and Robert. You know, the, the big thing is preparation. You know, I tell every client, just prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, 
we know that an average breach globally costs 3.86 million approximately, but companies uh, that have an incident response plan have a team in place and practice for these type of incidents, save about 1.3, 1.4 million. Obviously you can scale up or down, but you're still looking at probably between 30 and 35% financial savings. Um, and that's because when a breach hits, it's chaos. It's just pure and utter chaos. And companies that have that recognition and plan for it are in such a better position because they know the steps they need to take. And a lot of my clients that I talk to about this, well, the ones that have a breach and don't have a plan, they're really interested in creating a plan now after we've stopped the breach. The ones that don't have a plan before a breach are less interested because they don't understand the importance. So it's unfortunately trying to get that across to clients. Um, the second part is I view everybody on this call and this presentation in terms of the audience members so important in this process of pre-breach consultation. Uh, I mean, everybody here in the insurance world, your bread and butter is risk, you know, mitigating risk, mitigating harm. And the conversations you're having with clients, uh, insureds, each other, you know, evaluating it, you guys are on the front line. And I think that's so crucial because when I talk to broker partners, when I talk to underwriters or insureds, claim representatives, it's a conversation of we need to have a team centric approach here. We need to all work together to educate people. Um, and a big thing to me is I truly believe we're in a war. And I don't say that lightly, but I think it's an underestimated war. And the only way that we really can get ahead of this and start really taking the fight back to these hackers is to educate people, is to get them to have better infrastructure, is to get them to have the policies, plans, and protocols in place, is to get them to have a team-centric approach across their enterprise and incorporate these multiple different necessary parties from legal to crisis comp to insurance to technical. Um, and I think everyone on this call can really help people understand that, you know, rather than if I'm talking to say, I don't know, a professional service association, you know, they have a little less understanding of risk and risk management. That's why I love talking to CPCU chapters because you all already have that and are able to relate to it and understand how to ex almost explain it to people. So it's the preparation at the front end that organizations miss and it's also the lack of awareness um, and lack of team-centric approach, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo um, most of those comments. And, um, you know, people have mentioned tabletop simulations, um, cyber incident readiness review, security training, pen testing. These are all valuable things. Uh, and we do all of these things within AXIS as well. We have a training and advisory um, department that handles just that purely. Um, the other thing we do is... Um, we can administer training on um, how to recognize phishing because most threat actors don't need brute force techniques. I mean, they normally rely on employees, just let them into a, into a system um, through social engineering or phishing techniques. So if you can close that gap by training your staff to, to recognize these attacks, you become significantly more resilient against the attacks. Um, so, so that's probably the best advice. Um, I mean, we also run a, G8, a GCHQ certified um, course for brokers because they're the ones sourcing the business to us. So they need to be able to explain the cyber risk landscape and how cyber insurance provides the necessary protections because there's still a lot of people that are not, are not buying cyber insurance. And I think that that comes to the next point, which is, you know, pre preparation is one thing, but you also need to protect as well in other ways. So, you know, companies should really consider buying standalone cyber insurance, uh, but a product that suits their needs. Don't rely upon limited cover that might be available under another kind of insurance product, because most of them have limited um, cover or no cover at all. They, they might have a pure exclusion for um, cyber related causes. So if you're a firm that um, creates, develops or manufactures uh, technology, um, hardware or software, um, or you provide technology services, then you can protect against the costs of claims and litigation with a technology E&O policy. If you collect, store or process information of value, such as customer data, 
uh, business critical information um, or any data in that case, which can lead to financial loss or um, uh, reputational damage, then you really should consider buying a, a cyber policy with both first party and um, third party liability coverages. And, and the only other thing I would add really is, you know, organisations, we, we see, um, you know, a lot of the, the fallout from, um, you know, from a, a, a cyber incident um, and the impact it has on a business. And you can drum into a company the need to invest in IT, but until they really understand the, the impact um, on their business. And I think this is what, where Robert was coming from, talking about the, um, you know, the tabletop exercises, you know, actually run through them, actually cost out how long you would be likely be down, you know, how long would it take you to get back up uh, and running for your critical services? Um, is it five days, six days, two weeks? What would that cost the company? And then suddenly you begin to, you know, the, the important people in the room, the ones who are going to be paying the money to buy the cyber insurance uh, and invest in the IT and the, the increased security, they're the ones who then think, well, actually, yeah, it's going to cost me, you know, possibly 10, 25 million uh, to recover from a cyber attack. Uh, and maybe a, a fifth of that to to invest in all the things I need to to uh, you know to protect against it. So th there's many facets to this. I could go on and on, but we're limited for time. Wonderful. Hey, thanks very much, guys, for your uh, comments there. So um, I'm I'm just checking our chat, and I'm not seeing very many questions come in. I'm not sure if we have any. So. Um, if anything comes up as we're talking, please enter your uh, questions in there. Uh, Ken and Michelle are waiting for some questions to send to me. So um, let's move on to our uh, next question. Okay, a data breach hits and we are scrambling. What, what are you seeing as, as common pitfalls, common mistakes an organization is making during this time? So as we dive into that, let's let's have uh, Bob uh, start us off on this uh, discussion. Sure. So I'll share. So we're you know we're not the first um, you know first people that uh, a client experiencing a, an incident or a breach is calling, but we're pretty close to. So again, twenty four by seven by three sixty five. Um, some of the pitfalls that we see: one, beating a dead horse. You know, lack of an incident response plan. We usually, know within the first. 60 seconds if they've got anything at all. Um, and to, to Spencer's point, it's like, hey, can we build one really quick? Or do you guys have one and we can just like you start using it? It's like, can you give us your how it works. Yeah, can you give us your exactly how this works. But um, <laughs> uh, but the good news, is, you know, we do about 500 breach responses a year. So I think we're, we're pretty well versed in what needs to happen. Um, lack of one thing that people don't think about is putting in place agreements um, with a firm like ourselves, a firm like Spencer's in advance, a firm like Roberts and getting that out of the way and just putting it on the shelf. And so the last thing you want to be doing, and I've been on plenty of these calls, you know, and it always seems to be like Friday at five, all of a sudden client, you know, has a breach and they want to negotiate, you know, a, a letter of engagement set of terms and no offense, but their, their house is burning down. It's not, you know, they don't have a whole lot of you know, I'll say leverage at that point in time, and it's really not what they should be focusing on. They really should be focusing on their business and getting back on their feet. Um, on the technical side, uh, some things that we see are organizations that kind of, um, for a variety of reasons, uh, spend in some cases days or weeks sort of trying to analyze, investigate, and, and, and do it themselves without bringing in outside experts of any fashion, not just us, but from a legal perspective. Um, inevitably, they um, do a lot of things that then harm kind of the investigation. In some cases, they're, they're you know, restoring machines that we need uh, to do analysis on, um, or they are, you know, the lack of log files where the files are, you know, they're overwriting after seven days or 14 days or whatever. Um, and so we're sort of losing that precious data. Um, some other things, and again, a lot of these times it's good intentions. Um, the IT team, again, re-images machines. They're trying to get, you know, they're trying to get the organization back up on their feet, which is admirable, but at the same time, they're really harming any kind of investigation, um, you know, really any, um, you know, anything that we can do. Um, the other thing that we see 
is they have a sort of a false sense of containment. You know, so they the, the days of just pl unplugging a machine and saying we're good, you know, kind of isolated those it, it kind of doesn't work that anymore way anymore. So I think just really not understanding the potential or underestimating the potential impact. Um, I forget, I think I forget who mentioned it earlier, but most of these threat actors are very sophisticated now. And so they're creating multiple backdoors. In a lot of instances, they're deploying multiple variants of malware. They're doing some really sophisticated stuff and it's not that hard to do quite frankly. And so, you know, we see a lot of instances where clients say, oh, I contained it, it was small. And then two, three, four months later, they find out that they really didn't get it all. And they find out that their entire organization has been compromised. And now all of a sudden they're in a, a world of hurt and they could have, you know, significantly minimize the impact on their organization if they had just really, again, brought in experts early on in the process. Um, huge proponent of insurance. So definitely uh, kudos to Duncan for mentioning that. That's another thing. You know, a lot of clients are making, we see them make poor decisions because they don't have insurance and they're all about saving, you know, a penny when meanwhile, to Robert's point earlier, the reputation's kind of going down the, you know, don't going down the drain because they made some foolish you know, sort of short-sighted uh, financial decisions. So um, I could go on as well, similar to Duncan for a long time, but I will, I will pause and let some of my uh, fellow panelists chime in. Bob preaches my language and I think it's the Baltimore connection. I guess it's <laughs> in the same wavelengths, but um, yep. you know, Bob makes a lot of good points. Obviously for me, the biggest pitfall I see is such a gross underestimation of the legal aspects of this. When you ask anybody out there about um, data breaches, hackers, obviously we just think kind of what's in Bob's realm, the technical, which is extraordinarily important. But I can't tell you how many times I've come into a situation three weeks after a breach and clients have stepped into massive legal pitfalls. And that's because cyber law is so incredibly unique. Uh, just to give you an example. So every state in the U.S. has their own unique cyber data breach notification law. And each one of those has little twists and turns. You know, so let's just say if it's going to trigger a breach, you know, you've got to have personally identifiable information. Think information that you can't find on Google. But it's not, a, it's not the same across the board. Maryland's going to have a different definition than Texas. Maybe Maryland says health information. Texas says health insurance information. California might say social security numbers, and then Idaho says driver's license. So then all of a sudden you have different aspects that are going to trigger it. Then it's understanding that the laws are going to apply based on where your clients and employees past and current live and what information was taken from each. So when I've come into situations, I've got a client right now who called me, the breach happened a month ago, and they've been communicating one with state regulators and federal regulators. And I can't tell you how much of a headache I'm now in with this because of the amount of things they've said and that shouldn't have said. And they also contacted the wrong regulators. So taking a step back, there's also obligations where you need to talk to notif regulators before you tell people. So a huge pitfall for me is instantly thinking this is just a tech problem. And it is a huge tech problem, but it's two parallel lanes between legal and tech that need to run together simultaneously which is why the insurance part is so important because I can guarantee if Duncan got this call from my current client, you know, when it first started, the, this client doesn't have insurance, unfortunately, but Duncan would have said, all right, wait, let me get the tech and let me get Spencer involved at the same time. And we wouldn't be where we are right now. Uh, the second part is exactly what Bob said, neglecting to get these relationships established to start. It will cost your client no money, none to retain me as cyber counsel, if a breach happens and then retain Bob, retain Robert, and obviously get insurance. Insurance is gonna cost money, but in terms of retaining the people in place and then getting to know each of us, so then allowing us to know your organization, it's cost zero money because we're not gonna be doing anything at that point, right? But at least you have these pieces in place where you don't have to scramble. It's, it's horrible when I've gotta start negotiating Contractual details between, you know, when, you know, incur is incredibly reasonable, but sometimes you get insurers and clients who are not reasonable and want to have these in-depth negotiations. And Bob's right. It's like your house is on fire. We've got to stop the bleeding. Um, and finally, it's really 
stepping in when they don't bring insurance. Um, I've had clients call me a month or two into a data breach and they haven't notified their insurance. And that's a big issue because then coverage comes in and prejudice comes in. So, I mean, I think those three are the biggest ones that scare me and keep me up at night, having to basically weather those three challenges. Yeah, I mean, um, let me tell you about some of the common pitfalls from an insurance perspective. Um, so, I mean, we see all of the things that, um, you know, that uh, Spencer and Bob have mentioned, but, um, you know, being unprepared, not having an instant response plan, it, plan in place is, is a common pitfall. Um, and also trying to manage an incident themselves if they're out of their depth. You, you find this a lot with smaller companies. Um, the larger organizations generally have a greater capacity and depth of expertise and experience to both identify and utilize an attack. But some of the smaller companies they're working with are outsourced service providers um, who may not be large companies, they may not have great resources. Um, and the worst thing they can do is, is try to unravel it themselves when they don't really know what to do. And it just makes the problem worse. Um, the some of the other pitfalls, um, not having access to your insurance documents. Um, if they're held in systems which are encrypted or taken offline, it's a bit difficult to notify your insurers. Um, although we have act actually had incidents where the threat actors um, have been able to um, find the insurance documents very easily on the insured systems, and then they know what they they know first of all that the target has got insurance. And secondly, what the limits are. So if they're demanding ransoms, um, it it's, becomes a problem for us. Um, late notification to insurers and acting without consent are two uh, common pitfalls we come across, um, the two of which really go hand in hand. So that's like incurring costs which are not pre-approved or engaging vendors which are not pre-approved. Um, that can get the insureds into quite deep water, you know, if they're in, incurring lots of costs, because I think that the guys, the other guys on the panel will agree, most of the costs you expend uh, in dealing with a cyber incident are front loaded. So you can accumulate a lot of money in a very short time. So, I mean, most of the policies you'll find have something called like a 72 hour cl uh, clause, which will, um, and, and the reason those are uh, written into some policies is to allow for uh, weekend periods, public holidays, that kind of thing. Uh, because most, most data breaches occur on a Friday evening or over a weekend. Um, and it's difficult to get hold of your insurers then. So what we do is we tend to pre-authorize um, a certain amount of costs that can be incurred with pre-approved vendors within that first 72 hours. Um, it doesn't mean the insured is, is um, absolved of their duty to, to notify. Uh, and of course, after that 72 hour period, or if they wanna go off panel, they still have to get consent. Um, but we do find that a lot of people just panic and they go ahead, spend the money with an, pre, um, a non-approved provider. Uh, and then the, you know, we find out they're charging probably two or three times the amount the panel firms are charging. And suddenly you're getting into all sorts of conversations you really don't want to be having when you're also trying to deal with the crisis. Um, two others, not cooperating with insurers or their appointed representatives um, when they're asked for information or explanations. I think with data breaches, um, some insurers can get quite sensitive about the, the nature of the data exposed, the reputational damage. So. They don't want to give you too much information. They'll always claim that that you know they're jeopardizing privilege, but you know there are ways around that. We can sign NDAs, uh, you know, to to secure that information. Um, you know, if it's put through someone like Spencer, there's a certain you know you've got more chance of um, attaching privilege to documents than if there's a sensitive IT report or something. Um, so you know they it's very important to cooperate with insurers because it helps us to reach a decision more quickly and to reimburse the insured more quickly. Um, and I think also lack of transparency, particularly in remediation efforts or when presenting a business income loss or an extra expense claim. 
Um, it's really important to be upfront with the insurers in those situations because we really need to understand those claims. Um, business income loss and extra expense are quite complex calculations. Um, so, uh, you know, we need to understand exactly what they're intending to spend, whether it's covered under the policy. We'd rather tell them it's not covered under the policy before they spend the money. Uh, so they know they know the score from the start uh, than tell them afterwards. So those are from an insurance perspective, those are common pitfalls we see. Yeah, Duncan, that's a uh, transparency is a great segue into uh, the communications aspect of this. Um, and you know, we've all talked about the, the necessity of being prepared uh, at length, but you know, maybe I'll just spend some time and talk about uh, messaging strategy and, and timing there, because I think that's important and it's a pitfall we see. And obviously, Spencer's point about the com complexity of cyber laws is uh, is very well taken, and we look to legal teams and want to support their strategy. But the the timing of communications is critical, and most common pitfalls that we see are either communicating with customers, employees, any other stakeholders too early in a panic, or waiting too long out of fear. Um, you don't know what to do, so you do nothing. And these situations, there are so many unknowns. And companies are often reticent to speak because they want all the facts before communicating robustly, and that's admirable. And at the same time, you want to be transparent and on the front foot with your employees and your customers. You don't want to be paralyzed with fear, and you need to have a measured approach and make sure you're conveying as complete a picture as possible. Um, because once you begin to communicate, and once it's out there, not only will it become public and in the media sphere, but there will be an expectation of constant communication to follow, and there will be many, many questions on top of it. So it means that if waiting a bit to communicate uh, is the strategic, strategically the right move, then, then it makes sense. And again, we work with, um, with all parties on this panel to decide when that is. But be careful, I would say be careful, companies should be careful not to fall into what we call kind of the unless we know everything syndrome. Um, they're, they're, they're scared to engage anybody proactively without every single bit of information. And it takes um, you know, people like Spencer and, and me um, and all of us to um, guide them the right way from a communications perspective um, and legal perspective without um, jeopardizing the company to uh, needless liability. So it's really a balancing act and depends on the circumstances. But I, I think from our perspective, the pitfall is panic too much in either direction. Wonderful. Hey, very good uh, discussion. As you guys can see, there are some questions coming through. Um, let's get through uh, one more question for the panel and I'll just uh, ask us to um, maybe shorten our responses a little bit so we can get to some of these questions that are rolling in. So, so the, the, the chaos is coming to an end after that data breach, okay? What steps would you recommend uh, regarding remediation uh, that an or that organization should take? And Spencer, uh, let's go up, uh, back to you. I think you're on mute, Spencer. I was on mute, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, we need to revamp policies, protocols, procedures. I mean, you really just gotta go review, see what went right, see what went wrong. I mean, you have these policies in place, um, you wanna make sure they work. The next part is obviously keep practicing, you know, for the next one. Third is start looking at your vendors, even if they weren't involved in this breach. 60% of breaches start with external vendors. So anybody that you, contract with that will work with your company or that has access to the information in your company or that you provide information to, um, you need to make sure you're doing due diligence with them and have the contractual obligations in place. So those are the probably the three things I would start with. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I would just reinforce, I think it's important to communicate frequently and transparently with your insurers, um, seek their consent to your proposed remediation plan before incurring the expenses. Um, most policies contain consent provisions, so you, you have to comply with them. Um, costs must always be incurred necessarily and reasonably. 
Um, and it's really important to read and understand what the scope of cover is for the you know, income loss and extra expense, because um, that's where we see the most innov innovative claims, shall we say. Um, and um, yeah, these are complex calculations. Uh, we normally appoint our own forensic accountants to look through those figures. But actually, you know, you can talk to your broker and insurance at the sort of pre-risk level about agreeing on a joint expert, and this can avoid disputes further down the line. Definitely strong supporters of after action reviews. I would also, you know, if, if an organization's targeted once, they're probably going to be targeted a second, a third, and a fourth time. And I can't tell you how many times we have like a repeat offender list. We have a, a client right now. It's the fourth time they've come to us in the last six months with a data breach. And guess what? They use the exact same tactics, techniques, and procedures to get in. So finally, their CIO called me and said, all right, how do we not have this happen a fifth time? I'm like, why did it take you four times to call? Like, are you kidding me? Um, so just, again, just use it as a learning moment, but have a bit of, of a sense of urgency. Like, don't say, okay, let's lay out a 12-month plan because you are going to be targeted again very quickly. And again, a lot of this is automated. It's not that hard. It's like the easy button they push. So you really want to have a sense of urgency and not be like, whew, thank God we survived that. It's like, you've still got work to do. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and reputationally, I think it's important to show your, your customers um, that you're going we call it we call it beyond compliance and it's because you need to restore their trust and if they've lost trust that's directly correlated with your reputation and we see that highly responsive companies these incidents um, gain around 20 percent in market value within a year after the crisis while the alternative is true too the um, less active companies those who hesitate to respond lose about 30% a year after the incident. So that's a 50% gap there in market value alone. And so we view communication planning, you know, for this type of cyber event as insurance. I mean, it's protecting your reputational equity. It's protecting your company's value. And after one of these incidents, it's absolutely critical to do everything you can to restore trust. Again. Wonderful. All right, so let's let's jump into some of our uh, our questions, and there's some really good ones here. And I'm gonna I'm just gonna start off with uh, Craig's. Uh, he was the first one to uh, jump in, so thanks, Craig, for that. Any studies that are showing the the percent of successful attacks that that come in, you know, with 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 phishing or uh, social hacking versus those attacks that just breach the external firewall. Anybody have any comments on uh, any studies that are showing the percent of those attacks? Yeah, I mean, I can offer some. I mean, there's lots of, as you, if you just do a quick search on, you know, cybersecurity metrics and stuff, you can find a lot of reports and stuff that are out there. And they all, you know, although they are all different, they all sell a similar story. Um, you know, I think a common statistic that I've seen from a social engineering phishing perspective is it's usually in the 25 to 30 percent range. And then similar, they don't get as granular, at least none that I've seen specific to like firewall intrusions. Um, they, they view it more, it's a bit broader than that, but it's a similar number. It's usually in the 20 to 25% range. Um, so that's, you know, I don't know what others have experienced, but you know, those are, are definitely two of the more common. Um, and that's also, you know, aligns with what we see. Um, so, and usually a lot of times it's also, a little, it's not as simple as that or straightforward because they're, they're in a lot of cases, um, using social engineering tactics to then gain access to network infrastructure. And so sometimes the lines are a little blurred on how they actually got in and sort of, you know, the chicken and the egg, if you will. Yeah, we don't, um, I, I can't give you any um, statistics today, but um, certainly on a daily basis, we see a lot of phishing attacks. You know, if, if there's been any kind of ingress into the system, as I said before, it's normally because they've been let in by an employee just clicking on a, a malicious link or, or an attachment. Uh, and we find that particularly in the ransomware cases because you've got like the RIOC or, or whatever, the many, many strains of viruses that I can't pronounce and uh, <laughs> won't even try. 
which which are just attached and you know these get into the system and they they get into the system covertly they can be in the system for weeks or months actually kind of delving deeper into the system um and, and once they get in there the attackers can get the um uh the permissions of the administrators which gets them deeper into the system and once they're deep enough uh, and and broadly enough spread within the system that's when they drop the payload and it all starts with an employee thinking oh that looks interesting click and there you go all right let's uh let's jump into the uh, next one and, and, and this might be more for uh spencer and robert as i read uh randy's uh question from a legal perspective does the legal team need to have the, the, the specialized knowledge or education in the cyber crime realm and should an organization uh, that's a second part should an organization not rely so much on in-house attorneys but uh, that do not have that experience uh, I would say yes and yes, but I would move away from cyber crimes, just cyber. Um, this is a very specialized area of law. It's a spe specialized area of crisis comms, of tech, of insurance. Uh, and you need people who are laser focused on this uh, because it's moving very quickly. It's evolving very quickly. And in-house counsel is great. They really are. But they're wearing 20 hats. You know, they're dealing with contracts, they're dealing with real estate, they're dealing with employment. Um, and if you throw cyber at them, it makes it very challenging. And once again, there is very much unique aspects of cyber law that you need to be aware of. And I truly believe that you need people who are laser focused and who specialize on the cyber law aspect. Yeah, I agree from the community. I mean, I'm biased, of course, um, but I, I agree from the communications angle. Uh, it, it took me a dozen of these cases um, to, to feel comfortable executing on them um, and be more, you know, truly specialized and more than just a, a communications generalist who can help point companies in the right direction. And I think you really need somebody who understands how it can affect a company's overall reputation, how to work with cyber attorneys in this area, how the moving pieces all come together, and how to position the company for life after the event. Yeah, I can just echo again, be, you know, being part of the team, but clearly not, you know, we're not the, the, the legal experts, but it is very apparent to us when we get on a call, the initial sort of scoping call and the only attorney on the call is, you know, in-house counsel for the client and they, you know, some of the most awkward discussions we've had is where, again, we're not lawyers, but we've been on hundreds of these calls and we kind of know the sequence and you know, we sort of play one on TV, if you will. Um, we know when they're making the wrong decision and, and potentially causing harm to their organization. And so those are sometimes some of the more awkward conversations where we kind of have to say, you know, you're probably talented in your own right, but you're not an expert in this area. And you really need to go get someone like Spencer to, to give you the right advice. And, you know, Spencer can tell like one wrong decision can have a significant sort of domino effect. Um, and really jeopardize, you know, the, the organization. So, um, yeah, definitely, it is very obvious when we get on that call that they've got the right sort of legal expertise. All right, looks like we have time for one more, and this is going to be Nancy's. I, I, we we probably won't hit Jamie's, but we will make sure that we have uh, some type of uh, reply to that question, uh, Jamie as a follow-up to our discussion today. So that the last question is, how are you handling the possibility of, 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 of sanctions when insured, when the insured is paying the ransom, right? So how does that process work? Most, most cyber carriers can't reimburse or they could be sanctioned to it. Any thoughts around that? Um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of all kicked off with the OFAC guidance that came out in October last year, and it's it's caused quite a lot of um, uh, sort of inward review of, of processes and procedures uh, for insurers and, and the experts that we use as well. Um, so, you know, most insurers, I think, are looking at guidance around that, but I think we were already doing most of these things before. So we work with with experienced um, DFIR firms um, who sort of understand the you know how the ransom uh, attacks work, 
Um, they liaise very closely at a very early stage with the regulators and with law enforcement. Um, and, and the important thing is for them and, and the, the DFIR companies and breach co coaches will, will tell the clients this, that they need to document every step of the process. You know, uh, what, what sanctions have you checked? You know, the DFIR companies have got all the, the sanctions lists. Uh, they can check for names of organisations, names of individuals, um, the the addresses, the you know the IP addresses, um, even um, ransomware variants, um, and and even some of those are on sanctions lists. So I think as long as uh, the team and we talked about this group being a team and we are, uh, and the insured is included in that team, um, if you tackle it that way transparently you tackle it early, you involve law enforcement early, um, then if on the odd chance you pay a ransom, but it then later turns out that through blockchain analysis, you find out that money's gone to an organization which actually was on a sanctions list. As long as you've documented that process and you've been transparent and cooperative, you're very unlikely to, to face any enforcement proceedings. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the most recent OFAC guidance, I mean, honestly, I don't think it's really had any impact. We're still processing, we're still doing ransomware negotiations, you know, cryptocurrency payments, proof of life, all that stuff. It really hasn't. What it did cause us and, you know, everybody else in the industry to do was kind of pause, revisit our process for compliance checks around OFAC and, you know, all of the, the you know, making sure that that was bulletproof as much as can be. But we're definitely still processing payments every single day. Um, carriers are paying it, they're reimbursing it, they're approving it, you know, we're obviously not doing it without, you know, their approval. Um, one thing I always like mentioning, you know, dirty little secret is, guess what, the OFAC list is public record. Guess who also has access to that and is always trying to stay one step ahead? The threat actors. So it's kind of a joke. I laugh when people are like, well, you know, did you check OFAC? It's like, yeah, they're not like if they're if they're even like reasonably talented, they're going to not be, they're going to be looking at that and they're going to be, you know, changing tactics. So it's, I don't know, I, I find it a little bit of a worthless exercise, quite frankly, but we definitely, it's an important step in the process, um, but we haven't really seen an impact, to be honest. All right. Hey, it is, uh, we're bumping up against our time. Um, as you can tell, we could probably go on for another couple hours. And Duncan, Robert, Spencer, Bob, thank you so much. Um, obviously, we can't have a real, you know, applause and everything, but virtual applause. Thank you very much for your information. Very informative. And uh, just just thank you so much, guys, for, for your information you were uh, able to, to provide. Um, Heather, do you have your hand raised? Oh, yeah, she's, uh, she's uh, <laughs> clapping for us, so. Yep, or for you guys, wonderful. All right, Ken, I'm gonna turn it yep. over to you to uh, close this out. Okay, awesome. I'll, I'll echo everything uh, uh, Dar just said, thanking the panelists for their time today. Um, you know, uh, what great information that you shared. And, and uh, I think uh, we had great engagement here through our chapter. So uh, thank you so, so very much. Also, thank you to Dar for moderating today, uh, great job, we appreciate that. And also thank you to our programs committee. Uh, I know they worked with Spencer a couple of months ago to, to make today's uh, offering possible. So thanks all around there. And then just a couple quick chapter related announcements We're very short here on time. I, I just wanted to encourage everybody again, uh, if you haven't renewed your 2021, we're in May now, uh, society and chapter membership to make sure you do that today or very soon uh, and talk to your peers and colleagues that you know that might need to renew as well. It's very easy to do and you can reach out to us if you need any assistance with that. Um, this was again an excellent event to close out um, our offerings uh, until later in the year. So uh, we don't have a lunch meeting next month uh, but I do uh, ask you just to keep your eyes out for any communications that come from the chapter. We'll likely be adding some additional uh, offerings or events over the coming months. Um, and also put a plug in, out there for uh, the, the CPCU golf outing on August 6th. 
So pencil that in on your calendars. Uh, also, uh, just want to encourage you all to take advantage of ongoing educational events being put on, not by our chapter, but by the society. Uh, log into their website and you can see a lot of virtual offerings that are available to you. Uh, lots of opportunities to learn and opportunities to earn CE for CPCU uh, to keep yourself in good standing. So that, that's it for today. Uh, thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of the week and hope to see you all very soon. Thanks for Thanks having again. us. Thank you. All right. All right, guys. Thank you.